You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Just before the break, we were talking about validation studies, and one of the aspects that you talked about was proficiency testing, I think. Is that right? Competency. Competency. Are there blind proficiency tests that are issued to latent print examiners? If your agency requests one, yes. Have you been involved in such a test? No. Now, you're aware that over the last few years, that various agencies have tested where they send out prints and ask that they be compared and that they found both false negatives and false positives, is that correct? Objection. Compound. Overruled. Not personally, but I know of proficiency tests, yes. So you have not been tested at all? No. All right. In this particular case, in this particular case involving Mr. Jackson, you went over the original set of prints that were compared, and you participated in confirming the conclusion that either there was an identification or there wasn't, is that correct? Yes. There would be three results. There would be a positive, meaning it was an ID, a negative, meaning it did not match, or inconclusive, meaning that it could, but we couldn't rule out and we couldn't rule in. All right. And when you make a positive identification, is it your understanding under the rules that govern latent print examiners? Let me withdraw that. Are there any formal rules and regulations that govern latent print examiners in California? There's no formal rules, but our agency uses the ACE-V method, which is analysis, comparison, evaluation, and then verification. All right. You're familiar with the rules of ethics that have been promulgated by SWGFST? I've read them. Well, do you feel they're appropriate for the profession? Yes. All right, and they reflect, pretty much, what the latent print examiners as a group are striving towards. Yes. Is that right? When you make a positive identification, it is supposed to be just that, positive. Positive. And it's, there's no room. If you say positive, you're expressing the opinion that there's no possibility that anybody else could have left that print. Is that correct? It has to be 100%. If it's 99.9, .9, it's inconclusive. All right. And in this particular case, there were two prints that you had expressed an opinion on which were later determined by others not to be a correct evaluation. Is that correct? Which ones? Are you? Okay. After you got through looking at the fingerprints, you did that with Detective Spinner. Is that correct? Yes. And you and Detective Spinner each formed an opinion as to whether or not there was a positive identification or not. Is that correct? Yes. And you then reduced these opinions to written reports. Is that correct? I did not write any reports. Detective Spinner did? Yes. Did you review his reports? Not every one of them, but I, I verbally talked to him about everything. So you were aware that he was filing reports that reflected your conclusions that either a print was positive or inconclusive or negative, is that correct? Yes. Are you aware of two prints that later were determined by other examiners not to be correctly evaluated? I'm going to object. It assumes facts not in evidence. There's a lack of foundation as to her personal knowledge. I'll sustain the foundation. All right. Let's take it one at a time. Were you aware that 317L, you had formed an opinion, along with Detective Spinner, that the print was inconclusive, is that correct? I. Objection. Vague. There were a number of prints on 317. Okay. Let's get the exact one here. While I'm looking for it, let's just do this. Were you aware that, with regard to 317L, that one of the prints that you determined was inconclusive? Other examiners have come back and said that there is a positive match? We. Objection. Lack of foundation as to who the other examiners might be. Overruled. But the question. This is. The question is, are you aware of other opinions? Yes. Can I? No. You can ask your next question. Okay. Can I? And we are talking specifically about fingerprint number one, on page 31 of evidence item 317L, which would have been, well, anyway, evidence item 317L. Are you familiar with that print? Yes. And you and Detective Spinner decided that that was inconclusive, is that correct? 
At the time of, when we did all the comparisons, we did 24,000 comparisons, we figured, approximately. We couldn't spend a lot of time really evaluating. Your Honor, I move to strike the answer. Not responsive. Sustained. It's stricken. Could you answer that question? Have it read back. Record read. May I explain a little, other than a, yes, or, no? I have to have an answer first. Okay, yes. You found that to be inconclusive? At that time, yes. Later, there was a determination made by somebody other than you that that should be classified as a print belonging to Star Arviso. Is that correct? We did it together, yes. Okay, so you filed your original report, or Detective Spinner filed his original report on that particular item around the end of June of 2004, is that correct? Approximately, yeah. Okay, and that's roughly when you concluded your work making the comparisons, is that right? With that particular latent? Yes, I'm sorry, but with regard to that particular. Amongst thousands, yes. With regard to that particular item, 317L, which was a particular magazine, is that correct? Yes. With regard to that magazine, you concluded your work towards the end of June of 2004, is that right? I don't think it was too, in June, no. When was it? It was sometime in the fall. Okay, all right, in any event, fall 2004? Yes. All right, and then in February, or let's say January and February of 2005, you looked again at item 317 with Detective Spinner, is that correct? 317L? I think it was in January, yes. January 2005? Yes. Okay. We're in the middle, at that time, of pre-trial motions in this case, is that correct? I guess so, yeah. Jury's about to be. Well, it was the beginning of January 2005, because I, I was still pregnant. Okay, all right, and at that time you had already, by that time, you had already filed this report saying that print, that being fingerprint number one, developed on page 31 of evidence item 317L, was inconclusive. I did not file a report. Detective Spinner filed the report with that conclusion, correct? Your unit filed a report with that conclusion, correct? Inconclusive in November, October. And then we filed another report I believe in January. Yes, ma'am. And then, actually, the report that you filed. Do you have that report in front of you, by the way? I did not file a report. It's all. It's Spinner. Detective Spinner filed it, right? Yes. And you and he were working together in your unit, the Forensic Unit, Bureau of Criminalistics for the Sheriff's Department analyzing these prints, correct? Not, I was on maternity leave at that time. I came in on a, for a couple hours one day to meet with him. One day when? In January. Okay, so when he says that you concurred with him that this print should be reclassified, you concurred with him based on a two-hour consultation? Well, I would think it was more than two hours, but I can't say exactly. I didn't have a stopwatch with me. It was an afternoon. It was a print that was. We couldn't spend the time on it, as I recall. What I want to ask you is how much time, now. What you're saying is maybe more than two hours, but it was an afternoon. It was an afternoon, yes. All right. And in the course of that afternoon, did you review other prints other than the one that we just referred to, print number one on page 31 of 317L? Yes, I believe we reviewed all the inconclusives. All of them? Yes. And you determined in this case, between the two of you in that period of time, that your previous inconclusive should be now reported as a positive for Star Arviso, is that correct? Yes. There's, as an examiner, you always go on the edge of caution, so you want to make sure it's a positive positive. If you have any, if you want. If you want to rush a job and you don't. If you don't want to rush a job, you make it an inconclusive. How many weeks did you work on the fingerprint examinations prior to coming back in January? Oh, a few months. Few months? At least, yeah. And when you said, I forgot what the number was, some thousands of comparisons. Yes, 
You have ten fingers on each hand, and we had three people to compare it to, and I believe there was over 700 latents, so that makes approximately 21,000 comparisons. So you're comparing the 700, more or less, 700 latent prints? Approximately. To three people, each of whom had ten fingers? Yes. All right, and you said you never want to make a positive identification unless you're 100% positive, correct? Yes. And you said if you're rushing things, you definitely don't rush into a positive. You'd rush into an inconclusive? Yes, so you can spend the time later re-examining, if you have the time. In that same January time period, it was determined that your positive identification of fingerprint number one on page seven of evidence item 317-0 where Mr. Jackson was positively identified by you earlier, that that should have been inconclusive. Is that correct? We didn't make it a positive, because I still feel it's a positive. Bob feels it's more of an inconclusive. And so we can't come to a conclusion, so it's still an inconclusive. So, Bob, is Detective Spinner, is that correct? Detective Spinner, yeah. But once again, that had been written up as a positive prior to January and February of 2005, correct? By Bob, by Bob Spinner, yes. So fingerprint identification is really subjective, is that correct? Yes. In other words, it's up to somebody who has training or, in other words, or whatever their background is, to look at the latent and look at the rolled print and make a subjective determination that they believe that it's the same person, is that right? Yes, with training. And we have indicated with a couple of examples, and I won't go into any more particular ones with you right now. But there have been a number of other notable misidentifications of prints in recent years, have there not? Yes. All right, now, you talk about the ACE-V analysis. And the ACE-V analysis was actually put together really by Sergeant Ashbaugh of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police? Yes. And Sergeant Ashbaugh was a sergeant in the RCMP? Yes. And he decided that, oh, 20 years ago or so, that fingerprint analysis needed to be upgraded and have a more scientific vocabulary, is that correct? He was one of the many people, yes. And he, in fact, coined the phrase, ridgeology. Yes. Do you consider yourself a ridgeologist? To a certain point, yes. And he wrote a book with that name in the title, I think. Yes. When you say, ridgeologist, or, latent print examiner, you're talking about looking at the ridges and trying to see what you got in that latent, if it matches the ridges of the rolled print, is that right? Yes. Now, prior to Sergeant Ashbaugh's arrival on the scene and his writing and whatnot, the Galton points were given a tremendous amount of weight, is that correct? Yes. And by, Galton points, we sometimes hear there's so many points of identification where you look at a particular image on the magazine or from the scene scope or the super glue or the ninhydrin. And then you look at the rolled print, and you say, aha, that looks like the end of that line ends just about exactly the same place on both prints. Would that be an example of a Galton point? Yes. And at one time it was thought that simply counting the number of Galton points was a good way to make a positive identification, is that correct? A long time ago, they need to be the same orientation, too. All right, so we've gone from just counting, where somebody says, oh, We've got 12 points of identification, for instance, to looking at more than just the 12 points of identification? Yes. Ultimately, when you do your analysis, the first thing that you need to feel comfortable with is that you have a, a valid print. That is, a latent print is a print that was, in fact, preserved properly and enhanced, or whatever was done to make it visible, that all of that was done in a reliable fashion. Is that correct? Yes. And then you do an analysis of the print to see if there's going to be enough of a print and enough of a coherent print to do a comparison, correct? Yes. You could have one print over another that might cause problems, is that right? That's one of our problems, yes. And you can have a print that's on paper that's crinkled, or there's some other problem with it so you don't get enough of a print. Yes. You could have a print where just the edge of somebody's finger hit the paper and that's the only thing that will show up. Yes. So the first thing is, you try to analyze the print and make sure you got enough to go with. If there are danger signs, do you reject the print? 
Yes. All right. So, for instance, if there are too many, there's too much pressure, there's a smear or something like that, it may render the print really unusable. Is that correct? Yes. Now, assuming you find a partial print, which is a portion of that otherwise ideally rolled print that's sufficient, you go to the comparison stage. Is that right? Yes. So we're actually doing this ACE V thing. You do the analysis. Can I give a quick description? We did analysis, right? Yeah. Now we're going to comparison. That's C, A C? You have missed a few things in the analysis. Go ahead. Okay. You also look at the general pattern. If the pattern, the subject you're comparing to is a known, your suspect, has all whorls, and the print that you're comparing it to is a loop, you can eliminate him right then. You don't have to go any further than that. So you've got to look at the overall latent print as far as the pattern, the details in the, in the latent, and you can do some quick evaluation, right then and there, that you don't need to continue on to the comparison process. All right. So whether that's part of analysis or the first part of comparison, you do a basic overall comparison of the known or rolled prints with the latent. Yes. Is what you're saying. And then you go to a more detailed comparison if you feel we're still in the ball game. You got enough to look at, you think, and then there's a general agreement that it's either a whorl or a loop or an arch or something, right? Yes. So when you get to comparison, tell me what you do besides count Galton points. You look at the three levels of detail. There's the general pattern, then ridge flow of the fingerprint or palm print. Then the next layer of detail is Galton's details or minutia, which is what we call it now, and those are ridge endings, where the ridge will just go up and end, or bifurcation, where the ridge goes up and it separates into two. There's short ridges, which are just little short ridges in between the row of other ridges. There's dots, which are just a little dot. And there's scars, marks, warts, you know, other things. You look at those and see if they line up in the same orientation. And then you can go down to the third level of detail, which is ridgeology of the edges of the ridges, like edgioscopy they call it, and it's the actual way the ridges form, if there's a bump in it, or if it flows a certain different way. And you can also look at the porioscopy, the actual placement of the pores along the ridges. Okay. In order to get to what you're calling the edgioscopy or the porioscopy, you have to have a very good latent, is that correct? Yes. Most latents, for instance, on a magazine, most latents you're not going to be able to see that kind of detail to make that kind of comparison, is that correct? Most of them, yes. But some are clear enough, yes. And you talked about the Galton points. For instance, at one time it was thought that maybe 12 points of identification would assure an absolute positive identification. Is that correct? By some agencies, yes. In fact, some agencies went as low as 7 or 9 points of identification. Is that correct? I don't know. And we were talking about this lawyer who was falsely identified based on a fingerprint in Oregon in the Madrid bombing case, that there were over 16 points of identification that were established by the FBI in that case. Isn't that correct? I don't know how many points they went off. I looked at the print itself and I wouldn't ID it, so. In any event, whatever it was, it was enough for the FBI to say there was sufficient points of identification, correct? At that time, yeah, I guess so. Okay, in 2004? Yeah. And they were aware of this additional, the more than just Galton's 1886 approach to counting points. They were aware of all the advances that had been made in fingerprint identification? Objection. Assumes facts not in evidence. Sustained. May call for speculation, actually. Let me withdraw that. Have you worked with the FBI before? No. Now, once you get through with the analysis and comparison, you then go to the evaluation, which is the E. Yes. Part of ACE? Yes. And that, as we just said, is not a matter of counting points of identification, correct? No. So, I did that again, I said, correct. Is evaluation merely a matter of counting the points of identification? We don't count points. Okay. In other words, it's a subjective determination? Yes. That's, for instance, where Bob says, 
Oh, 317 O was Michael Jackson's print, and you say you don't think it was, or you don't think there was enough to make that determination, right? It's actually reversed. Whichever way it went, whichever way it went, I'm sorry if I got it backwards. But there's a disagreement, because it's subjective? It's, yeah. There's no scientific way of absolutely verifying the point, is there? Well, we strive to, as this is an applied science. But, it's an applied science, but it ultimately is your subjective opinion, correct? Yes. Correct? Yes. Now, the last, it's ace, and then usually puts a dash and a v, I suppose. Yes. And the v is for verification, is that right? Yes. And that means that ordinarily you would have another examiner look at your work, or you would look at another examiner's work. Yes, independently. And see if you come up with the same conclusion, is that right? Yes. And you're aware that many cases where there have been false positives involve just that. There was verification by two or more people in addition to the regular, or the original examiner, correct? Not personally, but by reading, yes. By reading about other examples in? Yes. And discussing them, your honor, since this witness has not gone into any more specifics, slides, pictures, I am going to ask for leave to bring her back at that time. If those are introduced into evidence, rather than attempt to take the people's evidence and put it up on the screen and go through it, if that's acceptable to the court. All right. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions at this time. I'll be brief. You've mentioned the word, subjective, a few times when you're talking about fingerprint comparisons. When you go through the ridges and pick out the minutia, what you're trained to do, is it your belief that those items are there, or is that something that other people, you hope, can pick out as well? Well, I hope that other people can come to the same conclusion that I came to. And you've used the word, applied science. Yes. Is your craft one that, I hope, can be replicated by others doing the same fingerprint comparison? It should be. Okay. If I did a comparison and I hand it off to another examiner, they should come to the same conclusion I did. And that's what an applied science is. That suggests some objectivity to this? Yes. Objection. Leading. Sustained. Move to strike. Stricken. Did you want to explain that inconclusive that you and Mr. Spinner went back to take a look at? Yes. Fingerprint comparisons. I'm going to object as, first of all, the question is vague. Secondly, that seems to be non-responsive. Can I rephrase? Yes. Okay. Mr. Sanger brought up an inconclusive fingerprint on item 317L. Yes. What can you tell us about that one? Objection. Calls for a narrative. Sustained. Can you explain what an inconclusive means? It means it's a difficult print, and you can't rule the person to be a positive ID and you can't rule him out to be a negative ID with further time examining it and spending time running the ridges and working with the print, you can turn it into a positive or you can turn it into a negative. But at the time of evaluation at that time, we wanted to leave it as an inconclusive, and come back to it, because it was a more difficult print to make an ID of. Okay, with respect to that particular print, an inconclusive fingerprint is one that you believe belongs to a particular person? Objection leading. I'll rephrase it, your honor. Did you have a belief as to who that fingerprint was made by, even when you labeled it inconclusive? Yes. Objection. Objection. That's an opinion without an adequate foundation. It's overruled. She's already testified that she had an opinion separate from the other person, so I'll allow the question. Do you want it read back? Yeah. Record read. Yes. And what was that? As Star Arviso. Okay. You mentioned that you reviewed all the inconclusives with Detective Spinner. Were there many inconclusive fingerprints? I don't have the complete list, but there weren't that many. And in fact, there weren't very many positive fingerprints either, were there? No. I'm going to object. Withdrawn. Did you withdraw that? I withdrew it. I'm sorry. Your Honor. 
Can you explain to us what you meant by fingerprint examining being an applied science? Asked and answered. Overruled. You may answer. An applied science is something that can be repeated by someone of the same level of proficiency that you are at. So if I did a comparison and gave it to another examiner, they should come to the same conclusion that I came to. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. One of the rules articulated by SWGFST is you don't express an opinion on an inconclusive other than it's inconclusive, right? Yes, but you still have a gut feeling as to what you, what you feel. And according to SWGFST, according to their rules of ethics, it's inappropriate to come into a courtroom and testify as to who you believe an inconclusive print may belong to. They deem that unethical, do they not? I guess so. Okay. Now, as far as your explanation of this applied science business, I understand that you come to this by certain training and experience, but when you put the actual prints up on the board, when I say, the board, the screen, for instance, behind you, and show them to a jury or a group of intelligent people, they should be able to follow your analysis in coming to the conclusion that there either is or is not a match, correct? On, yeah, yes, with some explaining and, you know, some basic training in the courtroom, yeah. All right, in other words, it's not, it's not, you're not seeing something that other people cannot see. You are appreciating things that you have learned to appreciate from your training and experience, correct? Yes. So when it's up there, the jury or anybody else in the courtroom can look to see the points of identification or the other characteristics of the print, the latent print and the rolled print, and they should be able to visually see the same things that you can see, correct? They should. Objection, Your Honor, that calls for speculation. Overruled. They should, you know, with some explaining from the examiner, you know, pointing out the details, be able to see everything we see. It's not reading tea leaves or something. No. Or where there's something mystical about it. No, they're there. All right, thank you. No further questions. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. Char Marie. Raise your right hand, please. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. My name is Charlene Marie. C-H-A-R-L-E-N-E-M-A-R-I-E. -E -E. Thank you. Did you bring my binder? I did. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you please tell the jury who you're employed by? I work for the California Department of Justice at the Santa Barbara Regional Crime Laboratory. I'm a senior criminalist there. How long have you been employed by that agency? Just about 15 years. How long have you been a criminalist? 15 years. Do you, on occasion, receive requests from the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office to process evidence on their behalf? I do. And what is the procedure in getting the evidence to you to process? The procedure is that someone from the sheriff's office will bring in the evidence. We also accept evidence via UPS, or in the mail. We serve San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties, so some of our agencies ship their evidence into us. And sometimes we go to the scene and help collect evidence. On or about February 4th of 2004, did you receive some evidence? Is that the question? I lost my place, from Elisa Hemmen. May I look at my notes? If that refreshes your recollection, certainly. On or about February 4th, did you receive an item of evidence from Lisa Hemmen of the Sheriff's Office? May I approach to see what notes are being looked at to refresh? Yes. Thank you. These are submission forms. So, yes, I did. I received evidence. And did you ask me what did I receive? Not yet. Okay. What did you receive? I received item 317, and various subsets of that, 317B, G, K, L, R, S, Y, double B, double C, double E, double K, double R, double U, double Y, and triple D 15 items. Okay. Did you note the date on a form anywhere when that evidence came to you? I did, on the submission form. Lisa Hemmen signed it off. 
I made a notation, IP, which means to us, in person, and my signature, and then I wrote the date. Okay. If she testified earlier that she dropped it off on February 5th of 2004, is that in conflict with your record? I. Objection. Leading. And calls for speculation as to when it was received. Calls for a conclusion. Sustained. What did you do with the item when you received it from Ms. Hemmen? I locked it, well, we logged it into the lab, and then I locked it in my evidence locker in the evidence vault. Did you mark the bag in any fashion? Yes, we put the case number on it, my initials would be on it, and the date that I received it. I've just placed in front of you exhibit number 529, is that correct? Yes. Would you please remove the contents of exhibit 529 and tell the jury if you recognize what the contents of that exhibit are? I recognize it. It's a sealed brown paper bag and this is my writing on the bag that has our lab case number for this case. That's my signature, and that's the date that I put on the bag. Is this the bag that you received on February 4th from Lisa Hemmen? Yes. Okay. Did you open that bag immediately upon receipt? I did not. When did you first open that bag? I'm going to check my notes. That's okay? I first examined item 317 the contents of this bag, in July, July 27th. And from the time that you received it on February 4th until July 27th, where did that bag remain? The bag was in my evidence locker in the evidence vault from the time I received it until May 20th. On May 20th, Detective Al Lafferty of the SO picked it up and he returned it the next day, on May 21st. So from February 4th until May 20th of 2004. It was in. Sorry. It was in your evidence locker? Yes. Did anyone else have access to your evidence locker? No. No? No. Okay. When you did open the bag in July? In July. Did you make a photographic record of the contents? I did. Okay. Did you also write notes on the photographic record explaining what you did at the time that you did it? Yes, I did. I'm going to mark this next in order, 766. May I have this two-page document? Do you recognize Exhibit 766? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury what is depicted in that? I took a photo of the front cover of each item that was in the brown paper bag after I opened it, so at the top is my writing saying that I removed the taped, sealed bag from the vault and that there were 15 items in the bag. I list them, and then I started taking photographs of what I saw in the bag with their item numbers on these two pages. So there are 15, 15 photos printed out on these two pages. Is Exhibit 766 an accurate depiction of? Yes. The record of your file? Yes. Does it accurately depict the magazines that were within Exhibit? What is the Exhibit number on the bag? I'm sorry. 766. I need to look at the bag. I'm sorry, I'll ask that question again. Is 766 an accurate depiction of what was inside the bag? Exhibit 529, when you received it from Lisa Hemmen on February 4, 2004? Yes. May I publish, Your Honor? Any objection? Is he offering to admit it, I suppose, first before he publishes? Yes. No objection. Move to admit and publish. All right. It's admitted. These are just the photographs of the front pages, correct? Yes. And there's a page too? Yes, there's a second page. The yellow stickies, post-it notes, that are visible in this exhibit 766, in particular protruding from 317R and 317, U, U, were those in place at the time that you received this evidence item? They were. Okay. When was Exhibit 529 and its contents released to the Sheriff's Office for good? On July 29th of, 04. Okay, so essentially you had that item for almost six months? Yes, but for the one day that it went to the Sheriff's Office and came back. For that period of time, was there, excuse me, during that period of time, was there any period that you were unavailable to work on this case? Yes. Explain to the jury why that was. I'm going to object. Relevance, your honor. Overruled. Last spring I spent seven weeks as a juror on a civil trial down in Santa Barbara.
trial lasting seven weeks. It's a short one. I thought it was long. I have no further questions. Cross? All right, how are you doing? I'm a little nervous. Really? Otherwise fine, thank you. Excuse me, now it's caused me to choke. Sorry about that. Laughter. To everybody's dismay, I have recovered, however. So, all right, just a few questions here. The exhibit that you identified, 766, which is the photographs that you took of the various items, first of all, are those all of the items that you took? On the whole case? In this bag, you said there was a bag of items that you received. Excuse me, were those all of the items? Are all of the items depicted in that exhibit? I believe so. I counted 15 items. Okay, and there are 15 here? 15 photos, uh huh. And this is from what you understand. When you say it's 317, you understand this to be Sheriff's item 317, correct? That's right. You never saw Sheriff's item 317 itself, did you? This is what I saw. This tape sealed paper bag that had 15 things in it. So if I were to take the time to find it here and hold up a black briefcase that was item 317, you would say, I never saw that. Right, I haven't seen that. Okay, and similarly, you mentioned that you had B. I won't read them all because it makes it difficult for the court reporter, among other things. But you have the various letters you wrote down after each item there, correct? Yes. 317B, and then BB, etc. Yes. That applies to you, does it not, Miss Marie? That there were probably other items that were labeled with letters that you never saw? It's quite possible, yes. Okay, the sequence that you saw goes as far as 317, D, 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 correct? Well, I have a triple D, I also have a double Y. Assuming it went through the alphabet, it went through a double alphabet and then went through a triple alphabet. It went at least up to 317, D, 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 it seems. Yes, in that case, there were a lot of other items that were named that way. Okay, and your job was to look at that with an alternative light source, correct? Yes. Did I ask you this? On 766, that's your handwriting on the notes around the pictures? It is. All right, and when you looked at the alternative light source, looked at the items with the alternative light source, did you find any suspected DNA to sample and analyze? Well, the light source is just a presumptive searching tool, and all it's going to tell you is if something's glowing. If something's glowing, biologicals do glow, so that's one area that you might want to test. Okay, is that what you were looking for? I was looking for biological material, yes. Bodily fluids, pretty much? Correct. The question is, did you find any? I did not. So as far as you could tell, there was no DNA to be tested from the materials you were sent? Well, there's no seminal material. There's nothing you felt. Just to make it clear, I'm not trying to trap you here, but there was nothing that you found and you said, aha, we ought to send this off to Sacramento or have a DNA lab do a further analysis of this, is that correct? That's right. You pretty much packaged it back up and sent it back to Santa Barbara? I did, yes. All right, very good. Thank you. No further questions. No questions, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. See, all that worrying for nothing. I know, thank you. Your Honor, while we're waiting for the witness, may Mr. Nicola and I approach briefly? Yes. Discussion held off the record at sidebar. When you get to the witness stand, when you get to the witness stand, remain standing. Face the clerk here and raise your right hand. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. My name is Eriberto Martinez, Jr. That's spelled H-E-R-I-B-E-R-T-O. Last name Martinez, M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z and the suffix junior, jr. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Where are you employed, sir? I work for the County of Santa Barbara in the Sheriff's Department. 
And have you ever seen the defendant before? I have. Have you seen him in person before? Yes, I have. Do you recognize the exhibit I put in front of you? It's a fingerprint card. Okay. Turn it over. Did you make that fingerprint card with Mr. Jackson? I took these fingerprints. Okay. Is the date written on the back? Yes, it is. Okay. And that's exhibit 766? It's 767. 767. You took those fingerprints on which date? On November 20th, 2003. And are they the fingerprints of Mr. Jackson? To my knowledge, they are. Okay. Are those inked fingerprints? These fingerprints are. I took them on a live scan machine. Do you recall that? Yes. How does the live scan machine work, just generally? When you take a fingerprint, it's on a glass plate, and it shows up on a monitor, computer monitor, immediately as you take the fingerprint. As you roll the fingerprint from one side, the finger from one side to the next, it shows immediately what you're taking a picture of. Okay. Do all these images stay up on the screen for some period of time? Each one will show up individually. At the end of the taking the set of fingerprints, it will display as it displays here, with all fingerprints showing. Okay. Did you take Mr. Jackson's fingerprints on that date? I did. Okay. And does that record reflect that those are Mr. Jackson's fingerprints on the writing on the back of that exhibit, 767? Objection. Calls for hearsay. It's an official record. Overruled. You may answer. I may answer? Yes, you may answer. Repeat the question, please. The question was, does the back of that document, 767, with the writings, indicate that those are Mr. Jackson's fingerprints? Yes, it does. Okay. And is your name and body number also on that document? My last name and my body number are on the document. Okay. Your Honor, I move 767 into evidence. No objection. It's admitted. No other questions. Cross-examine? Okay. Mr. Martinez, how are you? Very well. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. You are a sworn peace officer, or not? I'm a sworn officer, yes. Are you 24 hours a day sworn or when you're on duty? Only when I'm on duty. So you're a correctional officer with the sheriff's department, is that correct? That's correct. You're not a deputy who patrols or a detective, that sort of thing, is that right? That's right. Okay, and one of your duties at the jail, excuse me, from time to time, is to book people in who come in? Yes, sir. And you have other duties there as well, is that correct? That's correct. Sometimes you patrol various areas of the jail? I work in most areas of the jail, yes. So you've done pretty much anything that a correctional officer would do in the jail, I take it? Yes, that's correct. There you go. And you're not trained as a latent print examiner, are you? No, I'm not. And you? When you're taking these prints from people and using this live scan device, you received some training on that from some source? Yes, I did. It was on the job training? I was working at the time I was trained, but it was provided by the Department of Justice. Okay. Somebody from the crime lab in Goleta? No, it was a. May I check my note I have here? Well, okay. It was from the state. Somebody. I took a 15 hour class on fingerprints. Okay. And based on that 15 hour class, that's where you learned how to put people's hands in this machine and get the prints up on the screen? The actual using the live scan itself was on the job training. That's what I was asking about. So you had a 15-hour class as part of your training to book people in the jail. You had a 15-hour class on how to roll fingerprints, correct? That is correct. All right. And then you had the on-the-job training to learn how to use that live scan device, right? Yes, that's correct. So one of your supervisors or colleagues said, Okay, we've got this machine. This is how you do it? Yes, that's correct. All right, and you said you were, to the best of your knowledge, those were Mr. Jackson's prints. Do you have any question as to whether or not those belong to Michael Jackson? 
As I stated earlier, I'm not an expert witness on the fingerprints, so I know I took his fingerprints on the day noted here. Okay. If these are, in fact, the same ones, then, yes, they are his prints. It looks familiar to you is what you're saying? Yes. All right, I have no further questions. No redirect, your honor. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. Alicia Romero. When you get to the witness stand, please remain standing. Face the clerk and raise your right hand. Yes, I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. My name's Alicia Romero. A-L-I-C-I-A-R-O-M-E-R-O. -E Thank you. Your Honor, I have an objection to proceeding. It's somewhat technical, but could we just have a moment? I know you. They can't hear you in the courtroom. I say, could we just have a moment at the bench? I know you don't prefer that, but I think it's a technical. All right. Thank you. Discussion held off the record at sidebar. Your Honor, since we will not be prepared to go forward with this witness, we'd like to excuse her pending recall. We won't excuse you, but we'll recall you. You may step down. Sorry. We won't excuse you. We'll recall you. May we make notice to Miss Romero at her office? It probably won't be today. Yes. Remain on call. May I leave for today? Yes. She can return to work today, correct? Your Honor, we'll call Detective Tim Sutcliffe as our next witness. He's downstairs. When you get to the witness stand, please remain standing. Face the clerk and raise your right hand. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. My name is Timothy Sutcliffe. S-U-T-C-L-I-F-F-E. Thank you. Technical difficulties. Good afternoon, Detective Sutcliffe. Good afternoon. Who do you work for? Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department. What do you do for the Sheriff's Department? Currently right now, I'm assigned as a detective in the Forensics Unit, the Criminal Investigations Division. Are you a law enforcement officer? Yes, I am. How long have you been a law enforcement officer? Approximately 16 years. Have you worked with the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department that entire time? Yes, I have. And what did you say your current assignment is? I'm a detective in the Forensics Bureau of the Sheriff's Department. Criminal Investigations. All right. Tell me what the duties of a detective in the Forensics Bureau are. Respond to crime scenes, do crime scene investigation, evidence collection, searching for latent evidence, booking of property, seize the crime scenes, and sketching. All the facets of crime scene investigation. Have you had any special training in procedures for locating latent fingerprints? Yes, I have. I had. My duties as a patrol officer included also crime scene investigation, responding to take general dusting prints of latents at the scenes of auto burglaries and such. Also, I attended a 40-hour crime scene investigation course in 1999 that dealt with crime scene investigation. Also delved into latent print recovery techniques. I attended a class in 2003 at the Department of Justice in California regarding latent print techniques. I also attended a class regarding latent print comparisons, 40-hour class, also taught by the Department of Justice. And I also took a 24-hour course regarding the identification of palm prints. Have you had experience in the field and in the lab concerning locating and identifying latent fingerprints? Yes, I have. Can you briefly describe that for us? In the lab we do print techniques dealing with using the alternate light source, scene scope techniques, using chemical processes to develop latent fingerprints, and also using super gluing techniques, as well as fluorescent powder dusting, magnetic powder dusting and the like. So have you personally used ninhydrin solution to locate fingerprints? Yes, I have. And have you personally done cyanoacrylate ester fuming, if I pronounce that correctly, to aid in the detection of fingerprints? Yes, I have. Have you personally used the scene scope in the detection of latent fingerprints? Yes, I have. Did you participate in establishing a protocol for finding latent fingerprints in the Jackson, People vs. Jackson case? Yes, I did. 
Who else participated in establishing that protocol? At that time, I believe it was ID technician Torres, myself, and Detective Albert Lafferty. And can you briefly tell the jury, or, yes, just briefly tell the jury what protocol was decided upon to look for fingerprints on magazines that were seized pursuant to a search warrant of Neverland? Based on the type of magazines that we had, mostly of a semi-glossy, glossy nature, it was decided, after lots of consideration, that we would use the super gluing technique, followed by a scene scope search for latents after the super glue technique. And once that was completed, we would then do a ninhydrin chemical process to hopefully further develop some prints. And did your department prepare a PowerPoint presentation to guide us through this protocol that was established for this particular case? Yes, they did. Your Honor, could we have the lights dimmed? And I'd ask that you provide me with, input number one. For the record, this is a PowerPoint presentation. I presented a copy to the court marked as an exhibit and provided a copy to defense counsel. What exhibit is it? Madam Clerk, could you help me with that? 723. 723. Okay. All right. Detective, I'm going to ask you about each of these slides and ask you to tell me exactly what they depict, okay? Very well. Let's begin. This is a demonstration of the original photography recording protocol. Each magazine was placed on a copy stand, photo documented page for page. This included the loose pages which were not part of a complete magazine, which might be some of the inserts such as the little subscription cards you might send in to get another copy, that sort of thing. Were there also some pages that were standing alone, some pages that had been torn out? Yes. All right. Once that process was done, a digital camera was connected to the computer. The pictures were automatically downloaded and stored onto our forensics computer. Now, was this before any examination of the magazine was done, before any alternate light source, anything of that nature? Actually, we had completed some alternate light source examination of this prior to this process taking place. All right, so the magazines were intact when you first looked for biological materials using the alternate light source? That's correct. So then the magazine was taken apart after that portion of the protocol was completed? That's correct. Okay. As a matter of fact, here is showing the separation of the magazine after the photographs are taken. They were cut down the middle and separated into individual pages. And this is to facilitate the processes that we were going to be using to develop the latent prints. Each item was retained, pending the next process, altogether as one item. I'm not sure what that means. Do you mean you kept the magazines together? No, each magazine was kept, all pages together, before they were put into the next process. I see. Okay. At that time, they were subjected to a cyanoacrylate ester fuming process, and that's referred to as super glue fuming, and each separate page was hung in a fuming tank. In this case we have some aquariums which work quite well for that. Just need an airtight container. The pages were exposed for approximately 15 minutes, allowed to dry for approximately 30 minutes. And then they were individually placed into plastic sheet protectors which were placed into binders. Now, where was this process done, the fuming? The fuming was done in our lab at our Santa Barbara station. Okay. And who was it that was assigned the task of fuming all of these magazines? Detective Spinner did the majority of the fuming. And I believe that he was assisted, at times, by technician Shelley. All right. Scene scope. Tell us about that. Moving on to. Tell us about that. Moving on to the scene scope which is, the actual scientific name for the instrument is a RUVIS, which is Reflective Ultraviolet Imaging System. SceneScope happens to be a trade name for the particular company that we use, but it's commonly referred to as that. And you use the SceneScope after the fuming is completed? That's correct. And where was the SceneScope, or SceneScoping of these individuals' pages done? We actually, excuse me, had two, used two SceneScopes, one at our Santa Barbara Main Station Lab and also in our Santa Maria Station Lab. What does this slide depict? This is showing ID technician Torres just demonstrating the scene scoping process. Each page was examined for latent prints using the scene scope. We had it hooked to a monitor, just as was displayed yesterday, but obviously a lot smaller, so that we could scan the, each page individually. And as we came across what might be a usable print, we then marked and identified that print with the use of a permanent marker. We had a numbered grid that we used to reference the location on the page. 
To get into an anhydrin process, it can run ink, so we wanted to make sure we still had enough area of location of the print in case that happened. So tell me a little bit more about this grid. I see a picture of it in the lower right-hand corner. Is that correct? There's a grid on that page? Yes, there is. And, go ahead. Excuse me. The grid is just a transparency that was. It was a transparency divided into 20 squares, and that grid was used to help mark the location of any known prints that we had developed. So did you have a separate number for each of those squares, 1 through 20? That's correct. All right. And if you located a print in one of those quadrants, you would mark it as 1, 2, 3, depending upon the quadrant? That's correct. And we used the template and always aligned it to the bottom and outside uncut edge so we'd have a clear edge to do our locations. Were there times when a fingerprint overlapped a quadrant? Yes. What did you do in that instance? In that instance, we referred to that area in our report as an intersection of whatever particular quadrant it was. And after you noted the quadrant, assuming you found a fingerprint using the scene scope, did you further mark it in any fashion? The print was marked using the marking pen as illustrated here. Also, we would note if there was, the first latent on the print, on the actual magazine page would be listed as L1. If we came across another latent print, it would be marked as L2. They were circled with the permanent marker showing the location. So you'd actually, now, you'd actually circle the print with the permanent marker on the page? On the page itself. On the page itself. All right. And you would identify the latent print as L1 through however many prints you found on that page? That's correct. And what would determine whether a print was designated 1, 2, 3, 4, etc.? At the time we found it, whatever sequence we were in. So if we'd already found 2 and came across the next one, it would be 3. Let's take our break. Thank you.